Hey, you guys, gals, and bums, and welcome back to A Few Bad Men. All right, today we have episode two of Dutch Schultz. And I got a lot to cover here, so I'm not going to waste much time. But if you want the uncut version of these videos, you got to subscribe to the Few Bad Men Patreon. There you can get all the uncut versions with all the graphic images that go along with all the gangster stories that I tell. All right, so without further ado, let's get into this. 1932 started off well for Dutch. Vince Cole and most of his gang were in the grave or in the clink. But even before Cole was on ice, Dutch was sending feelers into Harlem. There was millions to be made there, one penny at a time, and Dutch didn't just want his slice, he wanted the whole damn pie. The Harlem's number racket had been making money for Cuban and black bankers for years, and for the most part, they were unmolested. But in 1931, a former judge named Samuel Seabury was given the job of investigating corruption in the lower courts of New York by Governor Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Seabury's investigation uncovered rampant corruption. For the right price, you could get anything fixed. And the courts were a revolving door for the criminal element. Many of these criminals were in the numbers game. Seabury took notice of this and started taking a harder look into the policy game. His first targets were two East Side numbers men. Wilfred Adolphus Brunder, known as Willie Brunder, was a West Indian who got into policy in 1923. His first day, he made $7.13. By 1931, he was raking in 11 grand a day. His bank deposits amounted to $1,753,342.33 from January 1st, 1925 to December 31st, 1931. Jose Enrique Mira was born in Puerto Rico and he opened his bank in 1927. And his bank records showed that between 1927 and 1931, $1,215,566.29 went through his several accounts. Seabury opened his investigations into Brunda and Mira, and they both testified before him. Seeing that tax evasion charges were coming down the line, both Mira and Brunda took off. Brunda to Bermuda and Mira to San Juan. Not before both men left their banks in the hands of Big Joe Eisen, Willie Brunda's top lieutenant. Early in 1932, Big Joe Eisen was snatched off the street by two men who claimed to be cops. But the two turned out not to be cops. They were Bo Weinberg and Abe Landau, two of Dutch's torpedoes. As Abe Landau drove, Bo Weinberg put a pistol in the Eisen's ribs and said that they knew about him taking over Brunder's gang and they wanted their cut. He was dumped on the street and told he had a week to make up his mind. Joe Eisen made a call to his lawyer, Dixie Davis. Dixie was a young attorney, but he knew all the right palms degrees and he was the number one lawyer in the policy game. He told the situation to Dixie. Dixie told Eisen that the Dutch Schultz was moving in the Harlem numbers and it would be wise if he joined him. Dixie set up a meeting with George Weinberg, Bo's little brother. Bo was bigger, but George was much nicer. Dixie arranged a meeting and for 600 a week, Joe Eisen had a new partner. Soon he would be an employee in his own game. His bank became Dutch's pilot bank from which the Dutchman would launch his takeover. After a few months, Henry Miro returned from his vacation in Puerto Rico figuring that the heat from the Seabury investigation had cooled off sufficiently. He went to Joe Eisen and told him that he wanted his bank back. Eisen told Dixie, and he quickly set up a meeting with the Dutchman. The Dutch came into the meeting flanked by Bo Weinberg and Larry Carney. Eisen said that if Miro wanted his bank back, then he should be able to manage it, since he had been doing so in his absence. Miro protested his cut and the arrangement. Dutch took Miro into the kitchen along with George Weinberg. When they came out, Miro was excited to get started. Dutch told Eisen that Miro's bank would be returned to him and Eisen was going to finance it and return for one third of the business. But he would still be responsible for the $600 a week protection fee. The night before Thanksgiving, 1931, the number 257 hit. Now, to many Harlemites, 257 meant 2 plus 5 equals lucky 7. It was a number that was played a lot in November of each year. And this year it hit and a lot of bankers were devastated. Joe Eisen was hit for everything his bank was worth, plus 18 grand. Joe wasn't too worried. His new partner would help out. He called Dixie and the meeting was set up. Dutch arrived, flanked by the Weinberg brothers. He took his coat off and sat down, pulled his 45 from under his bulletproof vest and sat it on the table. Dixie explained Eisen's situation and he negotiated a loan. But since Eisen didn't have any collateral, Dutch said he would come in as a partner for two thirds of the business. Eisen was given a $200 a week salary. 
George Weinberg took control of the day-to-day. But no matter what happened, the books always showed a loss. So Joe never received his third. And he found himself living off his $200 a week salary. That would eventually be reduced to $100. When Willie Brunder returned to New York, he paid off his taxes and did 90 days. When he got back to Harlem, he too went to Big Joe Eisen and told him that he wanted his bank back. Eisen told Dixie and he arranged a meeting with George Weinberg. Brunder was told that the only way he could open a bank was under the Dutch umbrella. Brunder agreed to one third of his bank and $100 a week. After a few months, he went to see Dixie and asked about his money. What money, Dixie said. He said, just be patient. Everything will work out. Brunder had stashed away millions and didn't need the headache, so he retired from the policy. Now, while all this was going on, the entire New York underworld was being called on to help out in the Lindbergh baby kidnapping. Dutch refused the help and he was harassed for it. He was brought in and questioned. Now, whether his refusal to help out had anything to do with it, I don't know. But around this time, Dutch got on the radar of special prosecutor Thomas E. Dewey. He began to look into the Dutchman and how much taxes he hadn't paid. But for now, Dutch had a business to run. Prohibition was ending soon, and Dutch was looking to the future. Alex Pompez, known as El Cubano, was a Cuban, and he was next on his list. Pompez came to the U.S. in 1910 at 20 years old and got a job as a cigar roller. Eventually, he opened his own cigar store that he ran numbers from, bringing in eight to nine grand a day. The 257 catastrophe hit him hard as well, but unlike Eisen, he handled all the payoffs down to the dime. He was hurt, but he knew that his bank would be dead if he was. Even though he didn't need help, he was summoned to a meeting. Big Joe Eisen was at the meeting. So was Solly Gertz. Gertz was representing Dutch in this matter. Gertz told him that Dutch was in charge now, and if he was smart, you'd get some insurance. He was given two weeks to give his answer. After the two weeks passed, Pompey still hadn't come into the fold. He needed more convincing. That happened one night when Bo Weinberg and Lulu Rosencrantz walked into a cigar shop and said, the Dutchman wants to see you. They met the next Friday. Dutch walked in with Lulu Rosencrantz and Larry Carney. As usual, he pulled his 45 from under his bulletproof vest and laid it on the table and said, I don't like liars. You're going to be the first color I kill in Harlem because I don't like being lied to. You said you were going to turn over your bank and you haven't. I don't care if you go to the cops. It won't do you no good. Word had gotten back to the Dutchman that Pompez was going around to other bankers saying they should get together and get rid of Dutch and go back to the good old days. Pompez denied saying this, and at 5 a.m. he was released with a 40% share of his own game. The east side of Harlem began to fall into place, except for the Maloney brothers, Edwin and Elmer. They were Irish toughs who would not fold to the Dutchman's pressure. They held out for over a year and a half and eventually worked out a 50-50 deal with Dutch and a $300 a week salary. Then Dutch set his eyes on the black policy. But what he saw was black bankers not only willing to defy him, but ready to go to war with him. In June of 1932, Dutch's old mentor, Marcel Poffo, was arrested, along with two other men for the robbery of Max Berkowitz in the store at 30 to 97 31st Street in Astoria, Queens. They got away with $165, but were caught and were held on $75,000 bail. Okay, now one thing about doing this channel is that sometimes after I do a video and I'm getting ready for the next one, I find things that would have been perfect for the last video. This is one of them. I got my hands on a photo of Marcel Poffo, Dutch's mentor, so to say. Now, this is a few bad men exclusive. You're only going to get this type of skinny over here. So, you know, bump off that subscribe button. All right. So, Poffo's charges were dropped on August 9th, but he wasn't free for long. On January 2nd, 1933, Poffo was arrested along with three other men for stabbing a detective during a brawl on the speakeasy. He was arrested later in January 1933 for a bank robbery. Dutch paid his bail, and he was still out on bail when his body was found on the side of the road in Westchester, along with one of his co-defendants. They were tortured, stabbed and shot, and dumped on the road. It seems that Poffo never rose to the height of his pupil. When he died, he was involved in the jewelry heist gang and had $1,180 in rubber banded bundles on his body, as well as a diamond pinky ring. On August 26, police raided five of Dutch's numbers houses, including Miro's Cigar Shop at 2359 8th Avenue, near 126th Street. Twenty of Dutch's men were arrested. In the back room, cops found $10,000 in policy slips and $10,000 in cash. On September 17, 1932, 
Stephanie St. Clair reached out for help from the mayor. She put an ad in the Harlem newspaper explaining that the Dutchman was pushing out the black bankers in Harlem. Her rationale was that since she was paying the cops for protection, she should be protected against the Dutchman. On September 19th, Dutch's brewery in Yonkers dumped hundreds of gallons of beer in anticipation of a raid. The neighborhood would often complain about the gangsters hanging around and trucks going up and down the street at all hours of the night. Now they were complaining that the whole neighborhood smelled like beer. By the end of 1932, Dutch's organization was pulling in an estimated $20 million a year. Okay, so I covered the war between Dutch and Madame St. Clair and, and Bumpy Johnson in those videos, and I don't think I could tell them any better. So go check those videos out if you haven't um, to get the full skinny. But, you know, to make it short, Dutch had an idea of controlling all the numbers in Harlem. One of the bankers he was trying to control was Stephanie St. Clair, known as Madame St. Clair. She had been in the policy game for a few years, and she wasn't looking to become partners with anyone. In 1932, Ellsworth Bumpy Johnson was back in Harlem from doing a bid in Sing Sing. Bumpy went to work for the madam, and he agreed with her that she shouldn't have to pay anyone, especially a Jewish guy from the Bronx. Bumpy and the Queen met with some of the smaller bankers in Harlem, and they put together a war chest and went to war with Dutch to keep him out of Harlem. This war lasted for three years, but in the end, Bumpy would not only still have him in Madam's bank, but he would become the boss of Harlem's underworld. I suggest you go back and check out the Bumpy and his Madam St. Clair videos for the full skinny if you haven't seen them. In 1932, while Dutch had his eyes on Harlem, Thomas Dewey had his eyes on him. On January 25th, 1933, a grand jury indicted Dutch on income tax evasion. Dewey said that Dutch had not filed tax returns from for 29, 30, and 31. On $481,637 in taxable money he earned from his bear empire, and he owed Uncle Sam $92,000. Dutch had plans on turning into a legitimate bear salesman with the repeal of prohibition. Here's one thing. Dutch wasn't just a bear baron from violence. According to customers of the day, Dutch had some of the best beer on the market. Now just imagine, if Dutch were to settle with the government, did some time, he could have came out and started a brewery. And we might be drinking Schultz Light or something like that right now. All right. But Dutch didn't do that. He went on a lamb. He was hiding in plain sight. He was still out of nightclubs, and his lieutenants knew where to find him at his apartment in Manhattan. Dutch lived in a dummy floor apartment in the 54th Street building that Joey Noor was killed in front of in 1928. It happened to be conveniently close to Polly Adler's House of Pleasure. Dutch spent many nights at Polly's along with his entourage. Dutch felt so comfortable in Polly's that one day she returned from a day in Brooklyn to find Dutch in the kitchen with his feet up on the windowsill reading the biography of Al Capone. The cops searched everywhere from the Catskills to Florida and wanted posters were posted all along the East Coast. On March 15, 1933, Congress passed a bill, 316 to 97, to make beer legal again at 3.5% in some states and in New York as soon as April 1st of that year. On March 16, 1933, Dutch's main numbers headquarters was raided. 14 of his men were caught with $50,000 cash and a million in number slips, all with the current date. The city seized the money and Dutch put the word out in Harlem that all bets had been canceled. It took the cops three trips to get all the men and evidence into the station, but it only took 15 minutes for a professional bail bondsman to get them all out at $500 a pop. I got a little tidbit for you. All right. In addition to all the Dutch's other endeavors, Dutch and Johnny Torrio ran a huge bail bondsman operation, and Dutch put it to good use. While Dutch was on the lam, his lawyers were trying to get an agreement with the government to pay his back taxes. Dutch wasn't the only gangster on the government's list. 43 gangsters in New York were on the spot, including Lepke, Gura Shapiro, Johnny Torrio, and Ciro Terranova. June 1933, another one of Dutch's policy houses was raided. 18 of his men were arrested this time. August of 33, Dutch was almost caught by police who trailed him to one of his hideouts, but the Dutchman gave him the slip. All throughout the summer of 33, Dutch was blamed for every murder and robbery in New York and the suburbs. Dutch was on the run for almost two years until the FBI let it be known that Dutch was facing the same fate as Dillinger and Pretty Boy Floyd. November 26, Secretary Morgenthau let it be known that the government was not interested in settling with Dutch. And on November 28th, Dutch surrendered himself in Albany, New York. Now this is the same day that George Babyface Nelson got into the shootout with the FBI agents in Chicago, outside of Chicago, 
as he was getting killed, he killed two FBI agents. One of those agents was the agent who killed John Dillinger, H.E. Hollis. All right. Just so you know that everything is not happening in a vacuum. A lot of things are going on in the criminal world in 1933. All right. Dutch was taken in and his bail was set at 100 grand. It was reduced to 75 and it took a few weeks for him to get this money up. So he spent his time in a Troy, New York jail cell catching up on his reading. Dutch was able to scrape up the dough, but the judge issued an injunction barring him from leaving the jurisdiction. So he set up shop in a Harmony Hotel in Troy, New York. In March 1935, Dutch was low on cash, and he made a phone call to Julie Martin and told him to get $21,000 from the account of the Metropolitan Restaurant and Cafeteria Association. This was just a cover. Julie had infiltrated the union, and they were shaking it down. Julie was a loud, big mouth guy known to have a bad temper. He was mad that Dutch had asked for so much on such short notice. The real problem was Julie had taken some of the money from the account to start a taxi business in the Midwest. Julie hopped on the train with Dutch's mouthpiece, Dixie Davis. Later that night, Dutch had been drinking and he was in a bad mood. He told Julie that there was $70,000 missing from the account and he wanted to know what happened to it. Like I said, Julie was a hothead and he snapped back at Dutch. And in one swift motion, Dutch lifted his bulletproof vest, pulled his 45, stuck it into Julie's mouth, and shots rang out. Dutch pulled the trigger and Julie dropped to the floor with a thud. Dutch put his gun down and turned to Dixie and apologized. And then he told Dixie to leave. The body of Julie Martin was found wrapped in a blanket and tossed into a snowbank outside of Troy. According to Dixie Davis, when he found out that the body had been found with several stab wounds, he asked Dutch about it, and Dutch told him that he and Lulu Rosencrantz had cut his heart out. Dutch went into the Troy's police station and he denied having anything to do with the frozen corpse of Julie Martin. Dutch's trial started on April 16, 1935 in Syracuse, New York. There was a large police presence. The government didn't want their prize gangster rubbed out before they got through with him. When the judge asked where were his bodyguards, Dutch laughed. The government subpoenaed several of Dutch's men, including Bo Weinberg and his lawyer Dixie Davis. Also, 50 police officers were subpoenaed to talk about payoffs. On April 28th, the jury came back 9-4 for acquittal. The jury ended up being hung, but Dutch wasn't in the clear yet. Chief Prosecutor John H. McGevers announced that Schultz would go on trial again in Syracuse on May 14th, just 17 days away. McGevers said that they'll keep trying him until we get a conviction or an acquittal. After some back and forth, the trial was set for July 23rd in Malone, New York. Even though the government tried to paint Dutch as a vicious gangster, the people appreciated what Dutch did. He was seen as a hero. Dutch and men like him made sure that the people got what they wanted when the government said you were not allowed to have it. And now that it was repealed, there was no use in going back and punishing him. Maybe that sentiment came from the fact that Dutch was spending big money in Malone. Every night before the trial, you could find Dutch and his men at the Flanagan House bar, all drinks on him. Dutch figured you never know who's gonna be on the jury. It must have worked because on August 2nd, he was acquitted by a jury in Malone. He put word out that he was returning to New York. But Fiorello, LaGuardia, the mayor of New York, let it be known that he was not welcome. Dutch had no time to celebrate his victory because even while his trial in Malone was taking place, Thomas Dewey had started his campaign to rid New York of his criminal element. And some of those criminal elements had started to infringe on some of Dutch's territory. But they were not doing this alone. One of Dutch's most faithful henchmen, Bo Weinberg, had been looking after Dutch's Harlem's number empire while he was on trial. He saw his proceeds dwindle with the Dutch's big lawyer fees. It looked like the government had Dutch cooked. So Bo began to work with Charlie Lucky on splitting Harlem and if he was acquitted, removing him permanently. On September 9th, 1935, Bo Weinberg kissed his newlywed showgirl and left the hotel that they were staying and was never seen again. According to mob law, Bo got fitted with a pair of cement shoes and was personally pushed into the East River by Dutch himself. A subpoena was issued for Dutch in New York by Thomas Dewey. Dutch moved his operation to New Jersey. It was close to New York, but far enough away from Dewey. He was fighting extradition, but the last week of September, he was arrested in New Jersey, again by the feds. When he was released, he hopped into a car and headed towards New York. I guess he was heading to talk to some men about handling Dewey. Now, Hollywood will have you think that, that the heads of the crime syndicate had an office somewhere and they sat around the table making decisions and ordering contracts. But it was Ali Tiktok Tannenbaum that said that Dutch came to meet with Lepke, 
who was also facing Dewey investigation along with Gerard Shapiro. TikTok said that Albert Anastasia was given an assignment to tell Dewey and see if a hit was possible. Albert staked out Dewey's Fifth Avenue apartment for four days learning his routine. To make the rules more believable, Albert borrowed someone's baby and stalked Dewey pushing a baby carriage. Now, I think that the person who let Albert Anastasia watch their baby should have their head checked. Albert came back and said that the hit could be done. Every day, Dewey left his home early to go to a nearby drugstore to use the phone. He went there because he didn't want to disturb his family so early. Albert said that he could put a man inside. And when Dewey went inside to use the phone, the man would use a gun with a silencer, hit Dewey, and slip past the bodyguards who stayed outside. Although it was possible, it was not seen as being the smartest way to get Dewey off their backs. Dutch didn't like the verdict, and he let it be known that he would handle Dewey himself. Dutch had some good credit with the commission after all. It was his shooter, Bo Weinberg, who allowed Charlie Lucky to ascend to the throne. But Dutch was seen as a loose cannon. If he carried out his plan, the death of Dewey would bring too much heat on the whole New York underworld. And it didn't help that others had their eyes on his empire. So it was decided that the Dutchman's time was up. At this time, Dutch was staying in Newark, New Jersey. He wasn't hiding out, and apparently he had no idea what his fellow gangsters had in store for him. He could be found every night in the Palace Chop House at 12 East Park Street in Newark, a short walk from the hotel he was staying in and around the corner from Pennsylvania Station in Newark. On the evening of October 24th, Dutch made his way to the Palace Chop House with three of his men, Lulu Rosencrantz, Abe Landau, and Otto Abadabba Berman. Rosencrantz, 36, and Landau, 40, had been muscled for Dutch a long time. And in fact, it was Rosencrantz who dumped the body of Julie Martin into the snow after Dutch killed him and cut out his heart. Otto Abadabba Berman was 46. He was a racetrack handicapper, and he had devised a way for Dutch to fix the numbers game. He made sure that the highest played number on any given day didn't hit by strategically placing bets that would change the total winnings outcome at the racetrack because the first three numbers of that number was the winning number for the day. That night, Dutch and his men were in the back of the Palace Chop House where there was a small dining room. Dutch took his usual seat with his back to the wall facing the front door. Otto, Lulu, and Abe were seated in the booth on the left. At around 8.30 p.m., Dutch's wife, Frances, came to see him. They talked for a while, and then he gave her money for a movie, and she left. Dutch ordered a meal of steak with peppercorn sauce and fries, and then they sat down to go over the receipts to tally up the day's earnings. At 10.30 p.m., bartender Jack Freeman had just finished wiping the bar down when a black sedan pulled up out front and two hard-faced men got out and walked towards the chop house. A third man waited behind the wheel of the getaway car. Just then, Dutch was excusing himself to go to the bathroom. The two hard-faced men were Charlie the Bug Workman and Mendy Weiss. They were on Lepke's payroll, and as they made their way to the dining room area, Workman told the bartender to get down. He did what he was told, along with a few other patrons that were there that night. Before the two men even crossed the threshold to the dining room area, shots rang out. Workman opened up on the group with two 38s while Mendy sprayed the table with buckshot from a sawed-off shotgun. Lulu Rosencrantz had his back to them and seven slugs tore through his chest and abdomen. Otto Berman was struck six times in the body, neck, wrist, elbow, and shoulder. He crumpled through the floor underneath the table. One slug tore into Abe Landau's left shoulder from the back, another through his left arm, and one tore a gaping hole into his left wrist. There was one problem. Charlie the Buck Workman had noticed that the Dutchman was not among the wounded men who had by now gotten their 45s out and began returning fire. Mendy Weiss ran back to the waiting car, but Charlie took a moment to locate the Dutchman. He kicked the bathroom door open and found his target at the urinal, holding something less deadly than a pistol. Charlie pulled his back up 45 and shot twice. One blasted a hole in the bathroom tile, but the other hit Dutch right under the ribcage, hitting his spleen and liver before lodging in the wall behind him. Charlie made his way to the getaway car with Abe Landau firing wildly behind him. But when they got outside, the getaway car was gone. Charlie began to run, exchanging fire with Landau. Charlie got a few blocks away and tossed his gun. Abe Landau collapsed in the seated position on the trash can a few feet away from the restaurant. He slumped and his chrome 45 slipped from his fingers. Lulu Rosencrantz also tried to give chase, but collapsed a few feet outside the dining room. There was a moment of silence. Jack Freeman cautiously raised his head, just in time to see Dutch stagger from the bathroom unsteadily placed his hand on the table and flopped into the chair. He laid his head on the table and said nothing until he groaned for an ambulance. At this time, Lulu Rosencrantz, who looked like he was out for the count, rose to his feet and slammed the quarter on the table and said, give me change for that. He waited patiently while Friedman got his change and then he went to the phone booth, deposited a nickel and told the operator to send an ambulance. 
When the dispatch asked his location, all he heard was the receiver on the other end hitting the wall on the inside of the booth. It didn't matter. Police had already received calls about the shooting at the chop house. Police arrived to find Landau on the trash can, and when they got inside, they found Lulu on the ground, bleeding. Abba under the table and Dutch sitting in a chair. The detective asked him, what happened? He said, I don't know. I saw a fire, and then everything got blurry. I think I'm shot in the liver. The detective said, who shot you? He said, I don't know, but it was a damn good shot. Get me to a hospital, you're killing me. Dutch was placed inside the ambulance, still seated in his chair. And that's where I got to leave you guys off today. All right. I really want to get into what happened after this, but I got a lot more to cover and I want to get these videos out in a timely fashion. So remember, if you want early access to the videos, the uncut versions, you got to go to the Patreon that I started. I'll leave the link in the pinned comments down below. A lot of people said they couldn't find it last time. All right. So, so remember, bump off that subscribe button. Break that thumb, ring that bell, set it for all notifications. And if you want to slide an envelope upstairs to the boss to help the channel run smooth, the link is down below. All right. Thank you to everyone who donated last week. I appreciate you so much. So this has been A Few Bad Men. Keep your nose clean and don't take any wooden nickels. I see you in the funnies.